So a couple things I would like to say. This is my first time in Michigan. Um, I would also like to say that I am not a brewer. Uh, I'm an organic chemist, so um, we'll just leave it at that. Um, so this talk has kind of evolved to be focusing more on uh, history, education, and chemistry of beer. So how we use um, how we use the media of beer to actually teach science to undergrads and anybody in the community that wants to take this course. So if you just do a quick Google search of OU chemistry of beer, this is just a smattering of the uh, websites that we can, um, that actually come up with are associated with this. We developed this course, we were expecting maybe a couple hundred, maybe if we were lucky, 500 people to enroll. I then got put on some of these beer uh, homebrewing websites. Then it got put on Reddit. And uh, first semester, we, it's only been offered two semesters. The first semester, we had over 8,000 people in um, And when you have 8,000 people trying to access one server that was held, that was made for like 500, um, everything just crashed. It was so, it was, it was, it was good, both good and bad. And so people like me were some other graduate students that were brought in to help with this just phenomenal response to the course. And um, I'll kind of cover, we'll cover the history of beer and we'll talk about the, the course and some chemistry of beer. So just to start out, I kind of got to brag about the University of Oklahoma, about what a lot of the educational initiatives they have, the outreach that they're doing. Since this course was built to engage people, it wasn't just a, a fun how-to course. Um, and we'll talk about that for a little bit. Then we'll kind of move into the history of beer, talk about where beer was kind of developed in the ancient world. We'll talk about Mesopotamia, Samaria, Egypt. Then to kind of speed things up, we'll do a timeline connecting then to about now. Briefly talk about beer in modern America. Then we'll talk about the way the course was structured using this uh, program called Janix, which was built from the ground up specifically with the chemistry of beer course in mind. It has since blossomed into its own thing. Then we'll get into the chemistry of beer, and then I'll talk about some of the preliminary analytics of the course, how people did in the course, both that took it for credit and took it online. So University of Oklahoma, just a, they've got a rich tradition of a lot of community outreach. I've been involved with most of these. The Sooner Upward Bound and the STEM to Store Academy are targeted at high school students to get them involved in chemistry and get them learning, get them engaged in science. And we use a lot of... Uh, we look at echinacea plant, which is used in a lot of the traditional Native American medicines and being from Oklahoma, that's kind of a big thing. Um, first year research experience is used to bring in people um, in the very first semester of college and get them working in a lab to make sure that they actually enjoy doing what their, their major is. Then the two year chemistry community is to connect the people in the first and second years of college to make sure that nobody's falling to the side. We want to make sure that there's a cohesive community support group for people. Um, if you're interested in flipped classrooms, this uh, the core was developed specifically with the flipped classroom. If you're into flipped and uh, pogol type learning, that's what this was developed for. Um, the OUCBR, it used to be uh, PLU Phi Lambda Upsilon is the chemistry society, and it's to really connect undergraduate researchers and graduate researchers together. And then we, you'll see there's kind of a theme of, of, of cohesiveness throughout the department. And if you're really interested, I don't know if there's much from Michigan or not, but this is a new thing that they've got going on called citizen science. We now have a whole project that is a, a whole floor of a research building that is all de de dedicated to natural products research. And you can request a kit. They will send you a, a sample collector. You send them a soil sample from wherever you are, send it back to them, and they'll analyze it for metabolites and everything. So we're, again, it's, it's outreach to the community. But the biggest factor that led to the development of this course has been uh, this chemistry and culture of wine, and it's, it's exactly what it sounds. It's been a great success. There's about every semester for the past five or six years, 15 to 20 students from OU will travel from Oklahoma to Arezzo, Italy, where we have a sister campus. And at that sister campus, they will learn during, uh, it's a kind of split up into about six weeks. Half of the time, they will be in the classroom learning organic chemistry, learning biochemistry, and the other half of the course is spent in, uh, they tour vineyards and wineries. And so it's really blending both the hardcore science with the real world application. And it's teaching in a dynamic environment. We don't want to just teach in a box. We want people to really understand what the science they're doing and how powerful it is. Um, right here, this is Dr. Morvant. He was, uh, so he was the one who helped spearhead this course. He is now the director of uh, teaching and excellence at OU. 
he is also the one who spearheaded the course for the chemistry course. So Mark was really critical to this course. This gentleman right here, this is Dr. Glatzhofer, that is my advisor, who is currently in Italy. Um, he's been there the past five, six weeks. He'll be ne home next week. Um, I'm waiting for him to get back so that way I can graduate. Um, and so I'm not bitter or anything. He needs to go spend some time in Italian countryside. But to, from this course, people really wanted to bring it back home because there's been such a great response. I mean, you get to you get to tour wine and you get to learn about it. And so we thought, how could we how could we do that at, at in Oklahoma? As you can imagine, there's not a lot of wineries in Oklahoma. It's just not the the place where it typically the, the grapes will grow. So we decided that we could pick several things to to kind of move into having this type of dynamic learning. Um, we talked about the chemistry of cheese because there's a lot of interesting enzymatic processes that go on in cheese, uh, the process of uh, household products, so what happens with all the cleaners you use in your actual home, what goes on there, what kind of cool chemistry is going on there. This has actually been developed into a course that will be offered in, in the spring. Uh, the chemistry of coffee is, is, is really cool. I, I, I home roast, I don't know if anybody else does. Um, and so there's a lot of cool chemistry that goes on there. It's been developed into a um, into an undergraduate research project, but the chemistry of beer was really, really set upon as a way to bring in college students, because what's more quintessential to the college experience than, than beer? Um, there's some Facebook photos from several years ago that, that are luckily blocked right now, so um, I uh, would uh, advise not going on there and searching for me. Um, but, so, the people that really made this course possible were, were Mark and Paul. They were the ones that developed all the curriculum for the course. They wrote all the lectures. They were the ones that put together the, 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 the content. There's another guy um, who was the one who actually developed, who was kind of behind the scenes. But what's really interesting, what's really important about this course is that we, we partnered with local brewers and local home brewers. So we brought in um, Blake from Coop Ale Works, which is a local brewery in Oklahoma City, and so he's the brewmaster there. We brought in people from uh, Bricktown Brewery, and then some uh, uh, Bruce, who's really respected in the home brewing community. So there's a there's an ever growing uh, craft beer trade in Oklahoma City, and there's courses in Oklahoma City that will offer like a one to two day how to brew beer course. And so we it was really important to 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 try to bring people into the community to engage with people to make sure that we were getting the chemistry right and we weren't just, you know, doing whatever we wanted. And where I fit into this is I fit into the organic chemistry section. I'm an organic chemist, uh, so it's sort of electrochemistry, um, and that's where I fit in. As I came in, and when you've got 8,000 people that are trying to engage, we need a lot of people to, to, to engage back with them. So what my main function was, was to moderate forums, and if anybody was asking me any questions that we needed to make sure they were answered, it were me and another guy, Daniel, and we were the ones who went through and, and moderated. So that, that's kind of the story of what led us up to, up to this course. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Well, I'll mention that uh, the very first assignment we did was a f uh, free response. Um, when you've got 8,000 people, and you've got four people trying to grade 8,000 things, it, it takes a while. So we learned very quickly to have only multiple choice. Um, so we decided that beer would be a really good way to connect the science and the real world application. But we really want to talk about beer. We want to talk about why beer. Why is beer important to society? Why does everybody seem to have this, this, this fascination with beer? So we're going to talk about the history of beer. Is it, where does beer come from? How did it get so ingrained in our society? And as you'll probably already know, since I tend to ramble a little bit, so we'll call this a somewhat brief history of beer. So, go back 10,000 BCE, before Common Era, ancient Mesopotamia, Fertile Crescent, beer is where we start to first see it. Beer wasn't really invented so much as it was discovered, because you've got, uh, the big thing was is you're going from a hunter-gatherer nomadic society to a more civilized, more centralized places. They're starting to set up cities, and the big transition that came with that was the ability to cut and store grains, is that now you're not having to go out and forage, and we people start to notice that as these grains get wet, they start to, they start to get a little funny, and whenever you're having such a hard time and food is so scarce, you don't waste anything. And so people start to realize that after a while, this, this, this kind of rule starts to get kind of fizzy, and man, it really makes me feel good, so it's, it's, beer was really kind of discovered by accident several thousands and thousands of years ago. Really cool is that early beer was actually really brewed in vats. 
you wouldn't think, uh, it wasn't just, it's not as fancy as we had now, is you pretty much just took everything, put it in a big vat, and just let it go. Um, and the majority of brewers were women. Uh, it was seen as a as a as a women's job. It was a it was a, they were the ones that really that really crafted it and made it into what it was. Um, and it was because of it was similar to bread making. It was something as you imagine you've got bread making beer. They both use grain, and so women were really really influential in the actual early stages of beer. Um, there are uh, goddesses of beer. Ninkasi. There are hymns. We have written hymns from you know 4000 BCE of hymns to the goddess of beer. So, so women, very early on, were important in the, in the brew-making process. And we mentioned that when we think of beer today, we kind of think of a nice, crisp uh, drink. Well, this was, as you imagine, if it's just unfiltered grains and then everything together, your spices, it's just kind of this, this mass, this, this, this just gruel, this porridge. And so you had to drink it through a straw. So there's pictogram from 4000 BC of people drinking beer through straws. And actually it's thought that straws were invented specifically for the consumption of beer because you want to get past all that junk and get to that sweet, uh, sweet beer. And there's even speculation that without beer, society as we know it wouldn't exist because beer during the brewing process sterilizes the liquid and so you're getting to where you can actually have something safe to consume. And so when you have a safe water supply you can actually grow as a society. Some of the earliest known examples of writing are of, of, of that. Some of the earliest examples of writing are beer. This is a little, you can see kind of a beer jar, and it's kind of gotten more and more abstract as time goes on. And so earliest examples, so writing and beer go kind of hand in hand. There's recipes, there's IOUs. So people have been mooching off of each other for thousands of years. And it's just really funny how things don't change. And so beer was really developed in ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Babylon, ancient Samaria, and from there is where it really, it really grew, and then from there it, it, it shifted up to ancient Egypt. And so a brilliant ancient proverb, uh, the mouth of a perfectly contented man is filled with beer. Um, take that for what you will. So beer travels into Egypt, and in Egypt is really where it starts to make a huge impact on society. It goes from just being a staple to help people drink, and from that to a really being something that, that turns the, the cogs in society. Um, as I just explained how beer comes, that, but even then, it's gotten into religion. The ancient Egyptians claimed that, that brewing was invented by the sun god Ra, and then stolen by Osiris and taught to mankind. And then their beer, just for fun fact, is a uh, haket. It was a kind of a honey beer that they used. Uh, sugar as their their sugar is uh, honey. Mm -hmm. And so there's it's just been so in, ingrained now into society. It's gotten into their uh, gotten into their mythology. Jars of beer were placed in tombs. There are there are records of of tombs that have been found with over 700 jars of beer, with each jar being able to hold over six liters of beer. So you've got thousands of liters of beer, because I guess they assumed that they were going to have a good time in the afterlife. Uh, beer was even paid for compensation of work. Um, this isn't too surprising. We have the similar thing with, uh, you know, you pay somebody in beer and pizza to help you move, and so this is kind of, they were allowed up to three portions of beer a day. And their beer wasn't, again, what we think of. It was more like, it was almost more like fermented bread. You would take kind of the unreacted dough, and you put it in a jar and let it ferment. And so it was more of a porridge. It was actually where they got a lot of their nutrients from. So beer was, was not only payment and food, it also wasn't taxed. It was so important to society that any time pharaohs tried to tax it, everybody just went crazy. So it was, it was just, it's so ingrained in society. And again, most brewers were women. There's again, the Egyptian from Ninkasi has then uh, evolved into, I'm not even going to pronounce that, um, into their own goddess of beer. We're going to take a brief timeline, kind of connecting then to now. 1700 BCE, Code of Hammurabi decrees beer allotment for his soldiers and for his priests. Priests were allowed up to five liters of beer a day. Um, so I don't, I don't know what they're doing with this, but they, uh, it was uh, apparently different than the church I grew up in. Um, 1600 BCE, now beer is so ingrained in society in Egypt that over 100 Egyptian remedies call for beer in their, in their, uh, in their I guess, development. 1500 BCE, you're starting to see beers that have been flavored with mint, dandelion, whorehound, crab, oysters, and so if we think that's kind of weird. I mean, I mean, I've had bacon flavored beer. That's a little weird. I've had, I've got some chamomile beer at home right now, 
But if you think that this isn't just a, a refreshing uh, drink that they eat, this is this is this is actually a meal to them. This is something that you would you would use for nutrients. So you want to make it have all sorts of different flavors as you can. 800 BCE, beer is first brewed in what will later become Germany. So there's a long, rich tradition of beer making in uh, Germany. 55 BCE, the Roman legion starts to spread, and as they do, they bring beer with it, and they start to introduce it to Northern Europe. At about the same time, Chinese are brewing their own beer called Q, and there's a kind of a flask that would have been used. And even now, there's still, there's uh, Catholicism has its uh, patron saint of beer, Arnold Metz, when he was born in 580. So now, not only in ancient Egyptian culture, and ancient Sumerian culture and religion, it's very ingrained in our own culture. 780, uh, King Charlemagne, he appointed, he would actually appoint brewers to his royal court because they were so important, he wanted to make sure he had the, the best of the best. Then we now get to 822 uh, CE, which is common era, and we have the first example of people using hops to flavor beer. So beer as we know it today really only developed in the last 1,200 years. Then when Columbus sails to the New World in the 1490s, he discovers that Native Americans, they're brewing their own beer from corn and birch sap. Uh, 1759, Arthur Guinness signs a 9,000 year lease on his brewery, so he was pretty confident in what he was making. <laughs> Uh, 1860s it was when we really start to get in the Industrial Revolution in the United States, and so we're starting to see for the first time where beer can be produced on a large scale, not just in small, uh, small, like small breweries for themselves. Then the dark days we have 1920s is when prohibition starts. Um, luckily, only uh, 13 years later, everybody rejoices and prohibition ends. Then in 1935 is when we see the first example of beer being first sold in cans. And then as of 2014, there's over 3,400 breweries in the United States alone. So this is just a snippet of the history and importance of beer throughout the last several thousand years. And there's tons more stuff where that comes from. This is just some interesting facts. And so now we get to modern America. And if you go to the grocery store, this is the kind of stuff you're going to see. For me growing up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, Miller Genuine Draft was beer. That was what my dad drank, and so anything else was just crazy. He might go for like a, like a rolling rock if he's feeling adventurous. Uh, but So this is kind of the typical beer that people think of. And so it's just interesting that beer has this, this large, large history and importance in society. And then now almost everything is just kind of this pale um, drink. And then you've got Bud Light Lime, which is just an abomination. <laughs> and so it's just funny that, that, that how things turn out in that that this is what the average American sees, but, how to play to the audience a little bit, there's a uh, growing craft beer uh, trade in the United States. This is for the 2014. There's now over, um, let's see, of the market share of beer, there's 11% of it is now coming from craft beer. There's, it's almost a $20 billion industry. And that you've got, what is that, 1,400 brew pubs, 1,800 microbreweries, um, Beer City USA, Grand Rapids, was that two years ago? Last year? I don't know. Twenty something. Twenty thirteen. Current. Current. Oh man, even better. And so, and then there's uh, there's all sorts of home brewing websites. One of the lab mates uh, that was that worked next to me, she and her husband had their whole uh, garage converted into a brewery, and they made some of the most fantastic things I've ever had. And so it's just it's really cool that that we've kind of come full circle. As we went from small beer to now in giant industrialized beer, and we're starting to see a rise again of specialty craft beers. And it's just really cool. And with that, I hope you kind of got a nice um, overview of, of beer. So we'll get into the course. So the chemistry of beer um, was developed on this Janix course, and it was really really thought as a way to, to engage students, get them into, into the classroom. And it's important distinction is that this is not a how-to course. This is not a step-by-step -step guide of how to make beer. This is not um, just a little beer kit. There are things like that. There are courses I mentioned. There's one in the city of the in the city. That's Oklahoma City. So us country folk call it the city. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so the, what's important is that this isn't the, the, the design of the course. We will go through in the course. You will go through each step, and we will cover the actual interesting science with each step and from that you could learn okay if I heated this a little more here if I added a little more hops 
how is that going to actually change your change the brewing process? But it's not a step by step how to guide. Uh, that's just an important distinction. But instead, it's like I mentioned, we're really trying to engage students. We really want people to learn, and we want them to <coughs> interact, and we want them to be excited about what they're learning. So the course was developed um, as a 4,000 level course, so it is an upper division course. So to take the course, you should have had organic chemistry and you should have had biochemistry because we, there's a lot of enzyme kinetics, there's a lot of uh, reaction mechanisms that go on in the process. And it was really just set up as a one hour course because most online classes kind of get pushed to the side. So we wanted it to be kind of low, low key, but high reward. And again, it's, it's all set up for this, this blending of, of chemistry with real world applications. And that was also decided to, since brewing is kind of come, having a big comeback, is, is to have it um, be open to anybody in the world. And we had people in, I think, almost every continent, except Antarctica, uh, taking this course. And most of them were home brewers. We had a core of about two to three hundred home brewers who were really, really engaged in the course. And we had a lot of other people who wanted to just use some of their knowledge to just learn something fun. So this was all developed using Janix, and so I mentioned it earlier. So if you've ever taken an online course, they're usually pretty terrible. It's, uh, it's very laggy, it's just, it's not great. So this was really developed, it's an in-house, at OU, uh, learning platform. And it goes back to, in 2012-ish, the OU had an idea to really bring about some new digital initiatives, trying to blend multimedia content um, with social interactions. So the whole point of this is not only do you have your, your videos and your lectures and your quizzes and your readings, there's a whole social aspect. You, there's their discussion boards and forums and, and it's really meant to bring people together so that way you can exchange ideas online. And then from there it's kind of grown. There's now intro to computer programming, native, I don't know, something, hydraulic, water, something. So it was developed, though, specifically for this beer course. Um, the course outline, it's eight, eight sections. So we start out with just a, an overview of brewing, like what is beer, why do, why do we care about beer? Moving to some health impacts, because we want people to know that, that even though, you know, beer can have its, its, its joys, it also it has some problems. It can, actually, it can actually have some pretty bad, bad things. And so we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about alcohol metabolism in a minute, what actually goes on in the body when you actually uh, drink beer. We'll also talk about beer styles. It has the, the we go into Maillard reactions, Amadori rearrangements, all sorts of stuff that leads to these different flavor and aroma compounds. Malting and kilning, we go, yeah, so there you go, Maillard and uh, Amadori. So let's talk about at each step what happens. Then there's mashing and laundering, when uh, we talk about how, what, how, to call it, how the sugars convert. Boiling and hopping is where you get a lot of that, that alpha acid flavor, which is kind of that, that traditional flavor you associate with beer. I'll talk about how that occurs in a little while. Then fermentation, all the different ways that that can happen, either glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, or uh, Krebs cycle anaerobic respiration. And then finishing packaging, actually secondary uh, carbonation, um, how you like how different companies remove the, the particulates and how things are packaged. And so when you log into the course, what you'd see is something like this. You log in and it's very, very smooth. You have all the different units over here. You have the, uh, your, light, your videos right here. And what you have is um, we have Brewmaster's Corner, which we bring in at each step of the, 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 the brewing cycle to say, okay, what is going on if you were to brew this kind of beer? What would you want to happen in this step? And then we then go into what is actually happening at a molecular level. And then you have your different discussions and then farther down is quizzes and stuff. And then if you go on to the, uh, what's really cool is if you go in to watch the video, it has the transcript next to it. And so you can actually follow along and wherever you click on the transcript, it'll jump to. But then you can also highlight and add comments. And so you can set this either as a private comment or a public comment. And so what was really cool is we'd see that somebody would read it and say, oh, at this step of the process, I see this. And then somebody else would come in and say, oh, I never thought of it. So you had a really great dynamic. You had a really great um, community that built up around this course. And so my job was to go in and moderate these. 
So we have somebody come in and have a, con a, a concept they may not really understand. So they're asking, what's the reaction that allows carbon dioxide to dissolve into into a solution? It's not really a reaction. That's they're kind of they've got the, a physical and a chemical process um, confused. So what the Automi and, and Daniel and, and Keegan were all about was going through and, and checking all the different uh, comments. And you'll notice this is comment 30 of 137, and that's just for one section. And so there was just hundreds and hundreds of these to go through. And it was really, really impressive and really cool. Um, so now we'll talk about some of the course content. What are you doing when you take this course? Are you getting your money's worth? And if you're not paying anything, then you know, it probably doesn't matter. Um, so, uh, so what happens is when you, when you first drink ethanol, it's going to convert into acetaldehyde. And this can happen one of three ways. You either have uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, cytochrome P450, or catalase. These are just three different enzymes in the body that will, con that will do this oxidation from ethanol down to acetaldehyde. And that at each, of these, uh, each of these enzymes comes into play at different times. So the majority of it happens through alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, and whenever it gets to be too high of a concentration, you switch to P450. Catalase is the main thing that happens whenever you're in a fasted state, whenever you're, you're, you're resting, you're sleeping. The problem is, is that once you build up acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde is really toxic. It's really, really bad for the body. So this then has to be further converted down to the acetate. It gets oxidized down to the, uh, down to this uh, uh, yeah, the acetate. And then from there, it can then further decompose into carbon dioxide, water, fatty acids. And it'll be a precursor for fatty acid. So this is the generalized scheme. This is this is just one 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 thing of what happens when you actually when you actually drink beer. But we do go more in depth than that. So we talk about where does this all happen and what happens. So when you do this oxidation, you're using an NAD center so to actually do this oxidation, and this happens in hepatic cells. And so this is where the majority of this comes from. And so you see that we go, we go from ethanol and NADH or NAD plus to uh, acetaldehyde and NAD and a proton. So we're actually going through and saying, okay, this is what happens at which step. Cytochrome P450 I mentioned, um, it uh, happens at a, less, uh, at a lesser extent. And you'll notice it has a higher KM. So we actually expect students that take this course to have enough biochemistry to understand what a michaelis mitten constant is. You have to know some initial enzyme kinetics to be able to understand the material. But that's not entirely true is because we explain it in simple enough terms to where anybody that is not a scientist can come in and say, okay, I'm not entirely sure what this KM is, but if it's higher, it's worse. If it's lower, it's better. Um, so so we're, we're, we, we go into really in-depth, and we've got all sorts of associated readings with it. And then this, uh, yeah, so this happens in, in the plasma particulate cells. And then catalase, oh, and that uses an NADPH to an NAD+, plus. so similar to the, to the previous reaction, but you need molecular oxygen as well. Catalase is, uh, uses hydrogen peroxide to do the same reaction, except that it's now, as you would imagine, if it's using peroxide, it's found in the peroxisomes, and this has just a very minor role in this, in this cascade effect. Once you've started to build up enough acetaldehyde, then you get into aldehyde dehydrogenase, which takes place in, uh, uh, there's different forms of it, but mainly in mitochondria, so then this uses, again, similar to the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, using NAD plus and water to then form uh, acetate uh, NADH and two protons. And this, um, then this is further metabolized. So we really go in depth with each of these different things, and with each step of the process. And so this is just in the body. And now we get into some flavor compounds. So this is just... Um, when we get into more of the organic chemistry side, which is what, which is what my, my forte is, is that this is just a, a, a few of the, the different flavor compounds that can, that can arise throughout the brewing process. Some of them good, um, some of them not so good. Um, you'll see you've got your, your citrus and your florals and your, your apples and your, your bananas up here. Some of these citrusy flavors, vanilla, kind of sweet oaky flavor, clove. Um, these furans will give you this kind of sweet almondy flavor. Your, your, these are not entirely desirable. They kind of this funny. If you have anybody ever smelled uh, uh, two, three, uh, two, three butane dione, it, it's, it just smells like buttery cupcakes. Um, it's an interesting, and you don't really, and it's bright, bright yellow. I mean, it's like neon green and yellow, and so it's really interesting. So you've got all these different compounds that come about in the brewing process, 
And then you also have some like valeric acid, which will give it this kind of nasty feet smell. Uh, maltose, which is not bad, where you get that malty flavor of beer. Um, you've got this, uh, this aldehyde, which kind of gives it kind of a wet cardboard smell. When you have a beer that you've opened that's real skunky, and you know it's been sitting around a while, that's because it's, it's kind of got light struck, as that some photolysis has happened to make this uh, thial derivative in here. So that's that, that, whenever you smell kind of an old beer, this is what you're smelling. To somewhat, you've got DMS, which is that real cabbagey kind of, again, it kind of smells like feet a little bit as well, I don't know if anybody's ever used DMS. But then from hops, two of the, the main flavors you get from hops are these terpenes over here. Um, it's humulene, and I've forgotten the name of this one. And so these are two of the essential oils that you get from hops that give it kind of a, a really good hoppy flavor that we associate with beer. But the main flavor component that you see in beer are these alpha acids. So this alpha acid is, um, we say it's an alpha acid because we've got a, a labile proton on a hydroxyl group that's alpha to a ketone. We've got two of them, we've got one here and one here. And so these, um, they're, they're all uh, what associate that bitter flavor, the majority of it. We mentioned earlier about 1820s. Uh, CE is when we first saw hops being used. Hops is, if you, if you know anything about hops, it kind of looks like this when it's still in the plant. And then it's, these are all humulone derivatives, and humulone comes from the humulus genus, so th that's where the, the which plant is. And there's five main alpha acids. The majority of them are, are humulone. About 85% of the alpha acids you'd see in beer are humulone, where this R group is this, uh, oh, I can't think right now, secbutyl, uh, anyway. Then the other ones are cohumulone, adhumulone, pre and post humulone, where these are in decreasing amounts of, uh, of concentration. So you have about 85%, about 10% maybe, and then the rest of this is the last five is these. And so they all have a, a varying contributions to the flavor of the beer. And the other thing that can happen is that, as you, as you know, is when, when you're brewing beer, that during the, you start to actually, um, as you start to add your hops in, you then have to heat it. And in that heating stage, you get a certain percentage of your alpha acids that are going to isomerize into isoalpha acids. And so this is a, this, these are the two main flavor components that you associate with beer. And since I'm an organic chemist, I can't get through a, uh, a talk without going over a mechanism. <laughs> so how does this happen? Is that I've gone ahead and, and uh, represented these, uh, these vinyl groups over here just as R prime, just to make it a little, the structure a little easier to follow. So what happens is that as you've got your, your conditions and you're starting to heat, you have something has to come in and deprotonate this, this alpha acid. That can be water, um, it could be any amine on any type of any type of protein that's floating around, anything that, that, that's going to be able to, to deprotonate. It's not going to be the basic conditions because from because it's an alpha acid. You're going to have mild acidic conditions in, in your brewing process. So you deprotonate this, you then have a uh, you then put this negative charge onto this, out, this oxygen. That will then flow over and now be delocalized across over to this oxygen. And so you've got this, uh, you've got your, uh, your, your beta ketone. So now you've got your oxygen, the, you've got your negative charge delocalized. This can then further delocalize down to this other beta ketone down here. And so these three resonance structures can be, um, can be summed up in, in this one, this one uh, representation. And what's really important about this is that by having this delocalized on this whole half of the molecule, you've, you've effectively stopped that half of the molecule from further reaction. So anything that's going to happen is going to happen over here. And so from here, once you have this delocalization set up, this can tautomerize. You have your uh, enol tautomerized down to the ketone. And then this is where the isomerization occurs. And this can happen either acid promoted, base promoted, or thermally uh, driven. And um, since we, don't, we have some acidic conditions, but not enough to really drive this reaction forward, but we also, we mentioned we don't really have strong enough bases. We have enough to maybe deprotonate, but not really to drive this reaction forward. But when by the delta, delta we, we symbolize in the heat, is that if we heat this up, we then get a, I'm kind of loose with my arrows here, but you essentially get a, a proton, tr uh, proton transfer over to this ketone, and from here those electrons will push down and you get a one, two alkyl shift over to the ketone. And so then you've gone from a six member grain down to a five member grain. And so it's, this, is the, this is the important kicker of, of, what, how, of how you actually get your alpha, your isoalpha acids. 
And from here, you just throw you know, a little bit of acid, which is present in the, in the process. This will then protonate your, your isoalpha acid down here. And so these are your two main flavor compounds that you get whenever you're enjoying the beer. They're coming from your alpha acids, either cumulone, co, add, all the ones I showed in the previous slide, or the corresponding alpha acids. So these are, these are what you're enjoying whenever you drink a, a beer. And I just learned the other day, um, you've, you tell somebody you're going to give a talk about beer and everybody just wants to contribute. And I learned something the other day where, where um, the reason that IPAs are so hoppy is that it has to do with these, the, the concentration of these alpha acids, is that when you had British troops stationed in India, they wanted beer, and so they would have to tr they would have to transport it all the way from England, all the way down around Africa, up to India, and it would go bad. So to, to increase the shelf life, they add more hops, which increases the acidity, which keeps it from going bad. And over time, the sailors kind of picked up a, a, a liking to it, and that's where we now have your, your IPAs. And so all of that, the, the flavor from your IPAs comes from the, the alpha acids, the iso alpha acids, the, the terpenes I showed on the earlier slide, just because of, uh, so just from adding extra hops. And so it's interesting how, how beers that we enjoy have a significant uh, historical context, and that when you know what the flavor compounds are, you can look at the science and modify the flavor of your beer. And so I've rambled a little bit about science. So uh, we'll get into some course analytics. So this course has only been offered twice. Um, it was offered last spring and then last fall. It wasn't offered this spring. Um, we had 46 people take it, uh, 46 people take it for credit, 9,444. So the first semester we had over 8,000 people take it. The next semester things were a little more reasonable. We had about 1,000 people take it. So in Janix total in one year had over 10,000 hours of videos played with uh, almost a quarter of a million plays um, over all the courses. Well, of those 2,300 uh, or 230,000, 140,000 of those came from the chemistry of beer. So over, so this is a very, very high traffic site. It's very, very, um, it's a very, very good class if you're interested in taking it. Um, and the first overview of brewing course was viewed over 90,000 times alone. People that took it, so you have four credit students up top, non-credit students on the bottom. About there were about uh, 320 discussion comments that were from all students because if you took it for credit, you had to just you had to make discussion comments for a grade. But if you look at the number of those relative to the number of highlights and notes, it's pretty it's pretty drastic. We have about 70 people. To, we had about over the eight eight units. We only had about 70 notes um, from 46 people. So that's less than that's less than two notes per person, and then hot people also not very many more highlights, and those were only coming from about ten people. But when you look at people that took it for credit, we had you know almost four hundred people taking notes, and there were over over a thousand notes. So again, just over two, almost three notes per person. And then the, there was actually a little the, the discussion. We had a lot more people discussing things. Um, but not as big of a gap. So the people that were making, the, there were much more people making notes and making highlights that were really trying to make sure they understood it rather than, uh, than engage in the, in the discussion. If you look at how the, the course went, as you imagine, if you're taking it for credit, almost every student submitted almost every exam. But when you look at the first, the first uh, for the non-credit students, about 3,000 people took the first one, um, about Half the number took that, and by the final exam, we had just over 500 people. And this is actually pretty depressing in itself, is that we had about 9,000 people up here. So we only had about a, th a third of the people even make it through the first unit. Um, and then it dwindled. But the people that made it through, really, you see, it really starts to level off. And it, it's understandable, is that it's, it's a really big time commitment, is that you have to learn a lot of chemistry, you have to do a lot of assignments. And if you're you're not a scientist and you, you've got a full-time job or something, it's, it's hard to dedicate that kind of time to a course. So it's not surprising that this kind of leveled off. But the, the people that passed, it was really well. Um, really, really, they really seemed to enjoy it. If you look at grades, almost consistently, the four-credit students did a little better than the non-credit students, except what's really, what's, really, what's really 
really awesome is that Unit 8, if you'll remember, Unit 8 was the finishing and packaging. So the people that were involved in the actual practical side of how you package beer, how you process it, how you filter it, they knew what they were talking about. They didn't have to study. So they, they, they pulled ahead in that, in that section. So we had a lot of good, good response to the course. And just a little, just to say we got the brew from, we got a student that said, the brewmaster videos give an interesting take on the brewing process, and the class discussion helped me understand multiple views of information and take into account other students' learning, which is exactly what we were hoping to see. We were hoping to see people be engaged and learn from each other and, and just ultimately have fun learning science through the medium of gear. Um, one of the open comments, I, this guy's been, or girl, um, has been a grain brewer for over 10 years. They've read a lot of books, and that this course really helped explain the chemistry they've, they've come across and to uh, help them problem solve their, their, their brewing process. So hopefully this person learned some chemistry, there's a step there, um, that will help them to improve their, their, their beer. So I put up a couple good comments. The, uh, the, the, the negative comments were mainly from the, the, open, the open students, and they were all mainly focused on, I thought this was going to be a how to brew beer course, and it's not. And so that, and, and, and that goes with, with publicity. We, if you tell people, free beer course, uh, they're going to say, awesome. And then they're going to say, I actually have to learn something? Well, I'm not going to do that. So um, it was, it was, it was, we had a lot of people that, that were hoping to just get some fun information. But it's, it's actually, I mean, it's a 4,000 level class. We expected a lot of our students. With that, I'd like to thank the important people. We've got uh, Mark and Paul and Blake. As these were the brewmasters and the, the professors. Um, Adam Kroon was the one who developed the Janex. He works at uh, NextBot, which is was sort of spun off from OU. Um, Keegan, I forgot to add Dan, I'm sorry, Dan. Um, they were the other TAs. Center for Teaching and Excellence was, was the people who developed it. Uh, all the uh, appropriate people at the University of Oklahoma, appropriate funding. Um, you also have Wikipedia and Kim Wiki and OpenStax is because a lot of the content we use is if we're going to have an open course, we can't expect 8,000 people to buy a, uh, a textbook. So the majority of the content was on these open, these open, uh, open stacks, and the big one have open, uh, open content. So it was really interesting. And and if you really want to know a lot more in-depth chemistry, I invite you to take the class. Um, it's a great class. I've, I've watched all the videos. Um, mainly because I had to. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, it's, it's not going to be offered this fall. It'll be offered in the spring of 2016. It's free. Um, you can just go online and open up a, make a profile. And, and with that, I, I hope we got a nice, nice overview of, of our motivation, um, some history, uh, why we did this in the first place, and then, and then maybe learn something about the chemistry that goes on while you're brewing. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to any discussions. If anybody has any questions or anything, um, feel free. Any snide remarks, so I can take it. <laughs> Did you get into any of the chemistry of barrel aging? Not too much. We did have, um, we, we, we got a lot of feedback on different, different types of, of things that would like to be added. Um, one of the things that we ended up adding was a, a section on water chemistry, which has not been incorporated into the course yet, but um, I think it was Sierra Brewery, when they moved to, I think, South Carolina, the water was completely different, so they had to completely redevelop all their brewing processes. But that's not, I don't think that's something we've really gone into, is the different types of, we talk about what you might extract from a, from a barrel, but maybe not different types of other beer. Um, growing hops in, in West Michigan particularly seems to be becoming popular for some of the brew, local brewers. Um, I've had questions on how you analyze the hops to determine when they are ripe. When they're ripe? When they're ready. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, again, I'm not, I haven't actually had practical experience, but you could probably, um, yeah, I, I'm sure somebody's done it where they've gone through and taken hops at various stages and maybe done an extraction and looked at looked at the different compounds that come out at different at different age and times. I'm sure somebody's done something similar to that. If there's anybody here who's a brewer that would be able to answer that, I'd love feedback. I'm not a brewer, but usually two to three years is when you're going to start getting a real yield. But otherwise, I uh, contact Forest Valley Hop Farm out in Wisconsin. They have an incredible program um, uh, on a lot of resources to give more information about that. So. Cool. Anybody else? You can also send them for testing. We can test the uh, alpha and beta acids as well as the uh, tipping content or the essential oil content. 
it's a pretty expensive way to go usually. <laughs> most, most girls only have it tested afterwards so they can install the product. But there are some great material out there from also Michigan State University Extension. Anybody else? I was going to offer too for the, the gentleman who was interested in uh, barrel aging. We could do a chemical profile and just send the full barrel over and we'll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is Genix available to other institutions? Not current. I'm pretty sure it's only in house. It, it's people can, anybody else can pay courses, but if you want. Um, Mark Morvant's information or anything. I'm sure he'd be there. It's pretty new. It's only about a year, year and a half old. So. Um, what's OU's ERP system? The, do you guys, are you Vanner or do you know what they use? I, PeopleSoft? Or? Uh, PeopleSoft, yeah. PeopleSoft. So you do, Janix imports into PeopleSoft for grading and. Right, I'm pretty sure it's PeopleSoft. That sounds good. Uh, so, how many hours a week did you spend working with? Me, I was actually only a half-time PA, so I was only expected, well, my contract said 10 hours, but um, depending on the number of people. It was really, really front-heavy when you had three to, when you had, you know, three to 8,000 people, it was really front-heavy, but then as the semester went on, it got a little lighter, but it was, it was you know, when I, I only had maybe 10, 20 hours a week, of, and most of it was just looking through forms, make sure people were following concepts correctly. Did you track the number of video views? Did you track the amount of time each participant was active on Janet? Probably. There's a whole lot of analytics that um, that Adam Kroon would have. So he, they, we've got some more. We have the, the grades, most of the grades. Oh, I think I have the, the information on my computer, but it's over there. Um, you got a, if you pass the course, we gave you a little. You got a little medallion if you were a non a non course person, um, but. I'm not entirely sure because you also had people who would just read through the transcript instead of watching watching the videos. One question. When did the timeline wise, when did it start switching from barrels to stainless steel and copper Is there any reason for that? Oh I I have no idea, I'm sorry. Does anybody <laughs> open it up to brewers again? Um, that's something I don't know. Again, more of an organic case. <laughs> uh, okay. Any students that uh, in this course that are looking to get into industry, or, or what was uh, I know there's, there's ferment fermentation sciences programs, including central. We've Michigan got here. yeah. We, people we had a lot of people that took the wine course, and then subsequently took the beer course, and there's there that's another idea is to get people more more exposed to, to industrial side of things. That's why we really try to bring in local brewers to, to get them involved. As far as an actual program at OOU, not at the moment. Most of the people that took this course were uh, upper were upper um, division science majors like microbiologists, um, chemical engineers. And so we don't have that kind of program. But one of one of the professors at OU, she, she has her degree in food, food chemistry. So we have some resources. But nothing. I'm not, I haven't heard anything directly from who's gone forward from the course. If anybody's gotten involved with it. So I was going to ask kind of a related question. What do you know about your, your demographics? And so probably in house, you know. Right in house. Are, what their majors are, and what year they are. Um, what do you know about the? Um, there was no demographic stage. You didn't even have to put a name. You could have just a. You could just. We had like 90 people whose name was just A. Um, there was somebody named Brewbirds who was really, really cool. They had, a, they, they, they answered everything. They were really engaged. So, so we didn't, we didn't collect any type of data like that. How about even where, where we do have where they're from, though. They're, there's from all over the United States. Um, several people in, I'm pretty sure, in, in out, at least a few people in every, every major continent. So. Major <laughs> Did you have any synchronous learning, or was it all asynchronous with Janix? Um, the people that took it in class, the second semester they taught it, um, they met once a week. 
So the first time they offered it, it was an eight unit course and it was offered over the full semester. The second half, they may actually made it a short course because that was one of the, the problems that people were saying is that you were having two to three weeks per unit and you've only got one quiz, one exam. So the second half we made it um, to, to kind of complement that with more of a hybrid course. They had to meet once a, once a, once a week, I think Monday afternoons, to actually go over and see in face, uh, kind of face to face with the professor to see if they had any, any in-depth questions that couldn't be answered by a, by a forum. You had mentioned that uh, Oklahoma University had developed a course on uh, cleaners and detergents and cleaners. Uh, do you have any more information on, on that? Um, I could give, it's, it's called, I think it's a consumer chemistry course is what they call it, or chemistry in household products. They haven't, I know it's going to be offered in spring 2015, and I know who's going to be offering it if you want their information. The, uh, Chuck Rice at the University of Oklahoma. One more question. Have you guys started doing the course that say chemistry of whiskey, gin, vodka? <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of it would be that. That'd be another thing. Is that is that we're really trying to? I don't know how many distilleries there are around you know, around Oklahoma City, but what we're really trying to do is partner with local businesses to get their input. Um, that's one of the reasons the, the chemistry of coffee project has taken off to a smaller extent. Is there's a there's a home roasting. Uh, business up in that will actually either you can go in and buy equipment or they will home roast and sell it. But as far as as far as actual spirits, I'm, I'm not. I don't know if there's any plans to at the moment. But but you would imagine it's a lot of the same chemistry. It's a lot of fermentation and flavoring and and, and just biochemistry and organic chemistry. Well, if there are any more questions, I'd suggest that you could come up and talk to Nick. Uh, afterwards, but I'd like to thank everyone for coming and especially thank Nick for making this trip up there. <laughs>